Um, I'm basically going to take a couple of uh, exponents of the epistemic value of democracy as a point of departure. And, uh, and in particular, I'll, I'll zero in on Elizabeth Anderson's <coughs> critique of one type of explanation for the, for the epistemological value of democracy, and that is Condorcet's famous jury theorem from a couple centuries ago. Um, and I'll argue that while I agree with much of what Anderson says about democracy in general, uh, and even some of her critique of the Condorcet jury theorem, or CJT, I'll just start calling it the CJT, um, <clears throat> I think she uh, overdoes the critique a little bit, and, and there's a little bit more um, that one can do with the CJT than I think she gives it credit for, and I'll try to illustrate that. And, and the basic plan is, um, <clears throat> I'll take you through a few slides, and then maybe in the question and answer session, I can uh, show you some spreadsheets where I have just done some very simple kind of numerical experiments. Very simple, basically involving a maximum of three voters because you can, I think, illustrate um, some of the points that, that can be <clears throat> drawn from the CJT with, with a very few number of voters. Okay, so <clears throat> what is the Condorcet jury theorem? First of all, uh, Helen Landemore is another exponent of the epistemological <coughs> value of democracy, and the way she put it in a recent paper is that democracy would be preferable to oligarchy on epistemic grounds, even if one could identify in advance the smartest and most virtuous individuals in a given population. So even if you can, even if there's a subset of a population that really wants what's good for everyone, and is very smart about what that would involve, you still shouldn't leave it to those individuals. There's still something to be gained by universal suff suffrage and, and deliberation. Um, one way of uh, expressing the advantage of democracy over oligarchy or monarchy is con the Condorcet jury theorem, and this is how Anderson paraphrases it. If voters face two options, <clears throat> although it has been generalized since then to take in more complex um, possibilities. I'm only going to focus on this simple case. Vote independently of one another. Vote their judgment of what the right solution to the problem should be. In other words, they don't vote strategically. <clears throat> um, and finally, have on average a greater than 50% probability of being right. Then, as the number of voters approaches infinity, the probability that the majority vote will yield the right answer approaches one. Uh, and, and rapidly approaches one, even with a modest, modest numbers of voters. Um, and I could illustrate that with a very simple example right off the bat, just to you know solidify people's understanding. But maybe maybe everybody already understands. No, we don't. Okay, so I'm going to do that. So let's imagine a very simple situation in which there are three individuals. Um, and once again, they have a choice between two options, and they can either get it right or they can get it wrong. Um, in that situation, there are only eight possibilities, and I, and I um, illustrate them as such. So voter one could be right or wrong, voter two, and, and if you toed up all the combinations there, there are four situations in which two out of three make the right decision, in other words, uh, you know, the majority is, is correct. Um, sorry, there, there, yeah, there are four situations. And four situations in which the majority um, gets them, uh, gets the decision wrong. Now let's put in a couple of other of uh, Condorcet's assumptions here. So let's assume that each voter has a greater than 50% chance of making the right decision. And for the sake of simplicity here, I just assume that, that each voter has a two-thirds chance of uh, making the right decision. Um, in that situation, we can calculate the probabilities of these different scenarios. So there's basically a 30% chance that <coughs> all three make the right decision if they each have a two-thirds chance of 
uh, making the right decision individually. 15% um, chance that uh, two or that, that two out of three, that any situation of two out of three will, will get it right. And then because they have a, a greater than average chance individually, um, the, the, the cases in which the group makes the wrong decision have lower probability, right? That makes, that makes sense. So what does that turn out to entail in terms of the probability that the group makes the right decision? All we do is we add up all the probabilities in which the group makes the right decision and we end up with a 74% chance, which is greater than any one individual, uh, you know, the probability that they'll make the right decision. So that's just a, you know, maybe the simplest possible illustration of the Condorcet <coughs> jury theorem. So both Landemore and Anderson consider the CJT, but end up rejecting it. Landemore um, favored what's called the diversity trumps ability theorem, which is a, a much more complicated um, theorem over the CJT. Uh, she also considered but rejected something called the miracle of aggregation explanation. And she illustrated her arguments with the plot of 12 Angry Men, which I was motivated to, to go watch, which is a great movie with, uh, starring Henry Fonda. And it does really nicely illustrate the epistemic value of, um, of majority rule, um, as well as a hypothetical decision by the French government. Um, another critic of the CJT is Elizabeth Anderson, who favored a different alternative, namely John Dewey's experimentalist model. Um, she also considered, but rejected, Landemore's favored uh, diversity trumps authority, uh, uh, diversity trumps ability theorem. And she illustrated her arguments very interestingly with a case study of community forestry groups in India and Nepal. And I'm gonna focus on Anderson's critique because she spends more time on the, on the CCC <coughs> than Landemore, at least in these two papers. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, brings out some important um, points, but also uh, is maybe too quick to, to dismiss the, the CJT. So she has three complaints. One of them is that she says that the CJT completely misses the value of epistemic diversity because the CJT works even if all voters have the same probability of voting correctly. And the example that I just gave, that was true. They all had a two-thirds chance of, of voting correctly. And she, th she, she says that this you know, basically rules out <coughs> epistemic diversity. Secondly, she says that the CJT actually contradicts the value of democratic deliberation. So it's, it, it's only about voting. And, um, and, and in fact, uh, she says that um, assuming that, that the votes are independent actually denies the kind of mutual influence that happens when voters are, are deliberating. Obviously, voters are having a, an influence on each other, so why, why have this independence assumption? Yes? I get the second point uh, very well, but not the first. I don't see how the fact that it works, even if all voters have the same probability of doing the right choice, how that uh, makes it miss uh, the value of uh, diversity. I agree. Okay. And, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that in the next slide. Thank you. Um, and, and then her final complaint is that the CJT misses the advantages of democracy for correcting past mistakes. So I would submit uh, what I would call a partial defense against Anderson's first complaint. Um, and that is, uh, as I think you were just suggesting, even if Condorcet's proof assumes for the sake of simplicity that all voters have the same probability of making the right decision, such homo homogeneity of competence, so that's the, uh, one, one term for this, you know, the chance that somebody is gonna vote the right way is to call that individual competence. Uh, homogeneity of competence is not the same thing as epistemic homogeneity. For example, two voters could reason from different premises to similar conclusions about which option is best, but I think we might all agree that it's epistemically diverse if they start from totally different premises, even if they end up with the, with the same probability. So I think, you know, Anderson um, 
is wrong about this, and I'm glad at least one person agrees with me. <laughs> uh, secondly, it seems to me that statistical independence at the voting stage can actually represent epi epistemic diversity, regardless of how similar individual competences are. So this means that, um, <clears throat> yeah, once people go into the, into the voting booth, their votes are completely independent of one another, taking into account their individual uh, competences. Um, we can use that rather than homogeneity of probabilities to represent epistemic diversity. However, I think there was something right in Anderson's critique in that nothing in the CJT signifies the importance of epistemic diversity at the deliberative stage. And then finally, um, since statistical independence is crucial for the CJT, it is therefore not the case that the Condorcet jury theorem does not represent diversity as critical to the epistemic powers of diversity. So the CJT builds in the independence assumption, and, I, and, and I'm arguing that the independence assumption is a, is, a, is a kind of model of epistemic diversity. We could, we could <coughs> take that as representing epistemic diversity. Um, I, I think I can offer a full defense against Anderson's second complaint, uh, and that is that um, the independence assumption actually contradicts the fact of mutual influence among voters at the deliberative stage. Um, we can interpret deliberation as not affecting whether their votes are independent, but instead affecting only their probability <coughs> of making the right decision. Um, so basically, we all deliberate, and as a result, all of us, or maybe most of us, become a little bit more likely to make the right decision, but still, at the voting stage, our, our votes are independent. So there's, so there's no uh, necessary contradiction here between the independence assumption and the value and, or, or the fact of mutual influence in, in, in deliberation. So for example, deliberation might improve the average level of competence among all voters, but may diminish it in some individuals, for example, by inducing polarization. It is therefore not the case that the Condorcet jury theorem puts the two forms of information pooling characteristic to, of democracy, votes and talk, potentially at odds with one another. So despite the, the, the felicity of that phrasing, votes and talk, I like her way of putting things, um, I think she's actually wrong about, <clears throat> about this. Her third complaint, I think I pretty much agree with. Um, and she elsewhere states it. Uh, in, in, in these other words, uh, often majorities converge on an inefficient solution because they fail to anticipate certain consequences of the, of the policies they adopt. Uh, democratic decision making needs to recognize its own fallibility and hence needs to institute feedback mechanisms by which it can learn how to devise better solutions and correct its course, course in light of new information about the consequences of policies. The Condorcet jury theorem does not represent the necessity of, of, of such mechanisms. And I, I think that's true. There's nothing in the CJT that gives you the importance of revisiting democratic decisions. Um, and she also emphasizes the, the value of majority rule as opposed to consensus because majority rule is more honest about disagreement. And, and if you have a consensus rule, there's pressure for people to conform and then pretend that all objections have been met when they haven't. And this, she argues, can impair the ability of the system to then revisit and, and revise. Um, and I, I, think, I think I agree with that. Yet, the CJT may not have outlived its useful, usefulness yet. Um, and so I've begun with very simple kinds of simulations, such as we saw with, with the basic illustration, to model the benefits of ep epistemic diversity with and without deliberation. Uh, and the, the basic ideas here are um, there are diminishing returns of individual competence to individual power before deliberation. So the idea here is that if we did appoint a dictator and give that person lots of resources, that dictator could probably become more and more competent, but there would be kind of diminishing returns. Um, that, that's, the, that's the first idea. And then the second idea is that there are greater gains in individual competence from deliberative interaction among a larger number and or uh, more equal voters at, at the deliberation stage. 
And then secondly, I've begun uh, using the CJT as a point of departure to model the epistemic superiority of democratic over plutocratic <coughs> voting. So it's not just a question of democracy versus monarchy or oligarchy. You know, we can, we can have more complicated um, rules where people's votes are, thank you, where people's votes are weighted by their income, let's say, which is maybe <clears throat> realistic in terms of the, the actual state of our societies where wealth uh, translates into power pretty, pretty easily. Um, and I've, I've modeled three different situations, one of which is, uh, assumes that competence is uncorrelated with income. Um, a second type that I call Merido plutocracy is where uh, income is actually an indicator of competence. And then the, the third option that I call kleptocracy is where competence is negatively correlated with income and power. In, in other words, we have the least virtuous and or the, uh, the, the least smart who have the most power. Um, and just a little bit more on those before I finish. Um, so the, the, the key to the Moreto plutocratic scenario is that there are inequalities in competence and inequalities in power, but the inequalities in power greatly exceed the inequalities in competence. And um, I think maybe there are a couple of ways of, of justifying that assumption. As Landemore puts it, when it comes to assessing a problem and making political predictions, political experts hardly do better than lay people. So, you know, the most virtuous and the smartest are not much smarter than the, than the average, uh, and certainly not as much smarter as the power that they're given, um, etc. Even Adam Smith uh, put it this way, by nature a philosopher is not ingenious in disposition, half so different from a street porter as a mastiff is from a greyhound, or a greyhound from a spaniel, or this last from a shepherd's dog. So they're, you know, basically just justifying this assumption that um, differences in, in competence uh, are, are much smaller than differences in, in income and power. And then uh, maybe to just suggest there, that there might be something to this, this klepto kleptocratic situation, um, there's some recent research showing that at least in, in, in seven different settings, experimental and observational, uh, the rich seem to be less interested in the common good than the poor, which would challenge the, um, the virtue assumption that, that we saw with Landemore back at the beginning. Thank you. Could you and then, give me a real life example of either in the legal system or the voting booth where there is an objective right or wrong <laughs> well, um, I, I guess I could perhaps. Um, I don't mean that facetiously, but I'm. I mean, you, mean, you mean an actual example? Really? Yeah. Uh, of a policy that that was the right decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, there there are certainly uh, certain laws that were passed in Congress that I think were the right decision. I'm, I'm from the U.S. I think, for example, the. A lot of the environmental laws of the late 60s and early 70s were um, right and that they uh, did help to um, reduce environmental pollution and or protect uh, endangered species and I, and I do think that those are both good and, and in the public interest. Um, I think probably <coughs> um, you know the Republican tax cut that was just passed in the U.S. is is a bad decision. It's going to um, undermine the public good, and and I think we can we can back that up with plenty of scientific evidence. You know about um, people's well-being, for example, is indicated by dailies or other uh, kinds of indicator. So um, obviously none of us knows for certain, you know what's right and what's wrong. But but I think I guess I think of there there being. A truth out there about right. what's what's I agree with you. You have to okay. realize that in the U.S. right now, we're a little bit um, disoriented. Um, <laughs> yeah. That was outcome. the understatement of the year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I actually um, 
one of my fellow teachers of, of a class that I'm teaching right now, I was defending democracy in class, and he said, well, what about you know the, the latest election? We just elected Trump. And um, actually, we didn't, did because he got <laughs> two million fewer votes. Uh, secondly, the, the question is not whether democracy is perfect, mm -hmm. but whether it's better oh, yeah. than, than yeah, yeah. let's say, plutocracy. Right. Yeah. And in the case of Trump, voters uh, making more than $50,000 a year uh, most of them voted for Trump, whereas voters making less than $50,000 a year, most of them vote, uh, voted for Clinton. Mm -hmm. And so plutocracy would have done even worse. So maybe there would have been a majority if we had voted, if we had uh, waited by, uh, by dollars. Yeah. Daniel. I'm almost inclined to jump in on that rather than on my own question, so I'll just quickly ask two. Uh, so one of the challenges, and this is not maybe not in Anderson's paper, but one of the things that people who look to conversate People who argue that there's a limitation to extrapolating from Condorcet to democracy will look at the simplification of the choice space. So sure. if you have a two choice choice space, then you can, you know, but if you just add one, you know, which is uh, most often the case, most often our choice spaces are a little bit more complicated than A or B, mm -hmm. then uh, the assumptions that you have to make of people being just slightly better than average, uh, slightly better than random, uh, starts becoming more difficult to sustain, right? Because if you have, uh, right? right? Um, so, so, so that always struck me as kind of like you know the most, uh, the most, the most, uh, the most convincing one. I guess the other question, and this, this is sort of in, in response to this, is what do we mean by democracy? One of the things that frustrates me about the extrapolations is you know there's no such thing as just democracy where a thousand people raise their hands and decide. There, we have to aggregate in some ways, and you know you're right that uh, you know the way that we that it's done in the United States ends up, and we have that too. You know you can have fewer votes and still win, but you know the. the the, the, necessarily, there are aggregation mechanisms to turn um, votes into representatives, and the, 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 that's another way in which it seems to me that the jury theorem, um, uh, you know, kind of simplifies not just the choice space but the institutional sort of situation that democracies find themselves in. For sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of getting good policies, it makes it more difficult if, if the people are electing representatives and then the representatives have to make the right decisions and, and if we multiply those probabilities, they're going to get <coughs> lower and lower, I guess. Uh, so it's, I, I think that is, um, I think one could probably apply a, a probabilistic framework to justify the idea that face-to-face -face direct democracy is better, is, is going to be more likely to, to produce correct decisions than, than more representative um, kinds of democracy, um, but, I, but I haven't really tried to do it. Um. Yes. Uh, thanks, Greg, for the, for the presentation. So um, I, I'm interested in, in, um, in one of the quotes that you have on the meritocracy. When it comes to assessing a problem and making political predictions, political experts hardly do better uh, than, than lay people, and sure. I feel that um, it's interesting because this is definitely what Lamarck is claiming, but I think it can be misleading to put it there because Lamarck is not claiming, uh, from from how I understand uh, her work. I mean, you, you can disagree. She does. She's not claiming that um, that the the conversation theorem by itself is going to prove that uh, that democratic citizens um, have, let's say, a higher chances of making good decisions than experts. It may be true in the end. Um, that I mean, if you can, the problem with the, the CGT is that if you can show that a group of experts have a higher level, uh, a, high, a higher probability of making a good decisions than mm -hmm. democratic citizens, then you kind of have to to accept that we should delegate power to to these group of experts. And I think that's where the kind of diversity things comes in her theory. Like she does argue that that democratic citizens make better decisions than groups of. Um, of experts, but right. this is not due to an application of TCGTA, it's due to an application of the, the diversity Trump uh, Trump ability theorem. So Absolutely. I think that you may need more than the CGT to kind of defeat the epistocrats. You may need the epistemic value of, of diversity. Uh, I guess what I'm arguing is that, is that the CJT or, or at least um, approaches that use the CJT as a point of departure can model the value of epistemic diversity. I agree, Landemore is not leaning on that herself, and, yeah. and, and here I'm just using it to justify the idea that differences in ability are, are far smaller than differences in power, so, so, so I'm just using her there to, to justify that. But yeah, she, she herself rejects the CJT, as I said, and, and, and prefers the diversity trumps um, 
ability uh, theorem, but um, I guess I think we can model the value of epistemic diversity at different stages with something like the the CJT, and that and that's where um, I have these little spreadsheets that I can show, but maybe. Uh, I don't see any, any other hands. Uh, okay. Caroline? Sorry. Caroline? Oh, you have a question? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's just um, to follow up on that. Um, I wonder if you should distinguish in this discussion of democracy between the more the kind of representative democracy and the direct democracy. And it feels like your case for Converse is a strong case in support of direct democracy and referenda. And then I guess the question, and this is what I think was your question with the truth and false is, what types of issues are maybe especially conducive to um, more either or types of questions and what are maybe not so conducive. Um, and, it, and I think that's also what actually happens in democracies, right? That some themes are better for referenda and others are more the bundle issues where as you, I guess it was maybe your question, but what's true and false here, it's more whole sets of issues where people select parties and so on. And so I think that could be interesting to differentiate between these two things, you know? Um, yeah, and, 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 I, and I think that's one of the strengths of deliberation, is that <coughs> uh, people might come together to deliberate whether A or B is, is correct, but they end up saying, well, actually C would be better than, than, than either one. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of related to Daniel's question as well. I, I, I have to admit that I have not explored the generalizations of the CJT that look at um, more than just two options. Is there anybody in the room who has looked at some of those generalizations of the theorem? I mean, maybe you have. I mean, I haven't looked at them in the sense of, I've, I've looked at papers that have sort of looked at it, so I've meta looked. <laughs> <laughs> I can share, share some stuff with you. Okay, great. Um, now, on representative versus direct democracy, I mean, I think you could you could apply something like this framework also to representative democracy. But the question now is not um, policy A or policy B; it's candidate A or, or, or candidate B. So, yeah. <clears throat> Okay, really quickly. Thank you. Point. Just building on that issue, because I just arrived half a year ago from the UK, and I was just mm. thinking about the Brexit referendum. Mm. That's the perfect example of the third critique that you had in there, mm. which is asking a question that people can't really just say yes or no, because mm. the question was formulated in a way that mm. was, you know, do you think we should stay in the EU or not? Yes or no? Well, that's not quite the question at stake right now. And also the impossibility of feeding back to that type of response that we see the government just, you know, going with the derailing trail and not, um, yeah, um, following up on that. So I think that's, okay. that's a great example mm -hmm. in practice of, of the implications of that critique. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.